So, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first panel discussion of the Football Collective's Grassroots Football Series, where we will be discussing a range of topics and research related to grassroots football. When the call first went out for members of the collective who were interested in discussing grassroots football to show their interest, there was a huge response. I think this demonstrates the importance of grassroots football, as well as highlighting a number of issues present and potentially coming in the future for this part of the footballing pyramid. To start this series, joining me on the panel, we have Les Crang, who you may know as More Than A Game on Twitter. From Solent University, we've got Dr. Dave Webber, author of books such as How To Run A Football Club and Punk Football, Jim Kehogan. I think I've said that right, Jim. Yeah. And last but not least, from Birkbeck University, after a bit of a struggle to get him on Zoom, we have Sean Hamill. Um, so from my own experiences playing football and rugby league throughout my childhood from the age of four, I'm saddened to know that both pitches that I first played on are now overgrown and unrecognisable. However, I do recognise that this isn't the place or time for a monologue of my experiences of grassroots sport. And I also recognise this situation has become far more common across England in the last decade. And it's upon this point that I think we should begin. So Sean, if I can bring you in here, in the preparation to this panel, you questioned whether all that COVID-19 had done was shown uh, issues that were already there in the grassroots game, citing specifically a decline in 11-a-side teams and an increase in 5-a-side participation. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, we um, we do quite a bit of work with various projects that the are involved in, and um, one of their concerns is that participation across Europe is in decline uh, for 11 sites, significantly in decline everywhere in men's football. And they've actually got a project called UEFA Grow, which is about trying to help the football, the, the national associations uh, develop their capacity to generate income in order to be able to subsidize or develop the, the grassroots. Um, so this is this is a European wide issue, and you know, I mean, I played a lot of. I don't look like it now, obviously, but I did play a lot of eleven side football, and when I was younger, particularly when I was a teenager, and um, pitches were always available, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in the seventies. Now, obviously, we know what's happened in the past. I mean, what's happened since then is that there's been incredible cutbacks. And local authorities across the country, they don't have the same number of public pitches. The ones that are available aren't of great standard. I mean, I, I think the Football Foundation has done some good work on that, but that's a separate discussion. We've had the cuts in the school budgets, and worst of all, I think we've had the, the sell-off of sports grounds. Now, that, that's just a reality. Those trends were all happening. Uh, and I think the danger is that if, if something doesn't happen to stop that, I mean, I had a conversation with Jim last week about this, that it, it will just be accelerated by the crisis. You know, if you get more austerity, you get more authority selling sports grounds, et cetera, et cetera, then the, the pattern just continues. I mean, I think one criticism I would have of um, the football authorities is that, you know, where you have had a growth in participation is in privately organized private side, so power games, goal soccer center. And, you know, you don't have futsal, which is the official five side. I know that the FA has a lot to do. That's part of the problem. But it is a fact that private initiatives have been able to some extent provide people with opportunities to play. And personally, I think what that tells us is that, you know, the, the Football organisations, sporting organisations need to be more nimble about how they deliver the uh, the game. Now, it's not just about more money, but I think the money is 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 a critical factor. Something that really concerns me, going back to the days when I was heavily involved with supporters direct. I mean, I was elected director from 2003 to 2009. Was that um, there are always asset strippers? are floating around the football world looking to buy teams because they want the ground. And that, uh, I think that that is a real danger now, that you know you will have investment funds who are liquid in cash, and you will have a, clubs going bankrupt, or it's, um, and, um, and they will be very vulnerable for the team to be taken over 
purely for the ground. So I think we are at a, at a dangerous moment uh, because of the existing prior trends. But the, the, the danger is, is accentuated by the fact that you know, the assets that remain are very, very vulnerable to being stripped by an invest, uh, you know, investment funds. Yeah, so one of the, the things that we were discussing um, in the preparation for this was the impact of austerity on football. I think it's unavoidable when you discuss something like this, when you, you look at the over 600 youth clubs that have been disbanded, over 700 green spaces that have been sold off since Cameron Osborne's ideological destruction of, of community sport. Um, and this is impinging the, the opportunity of, of a lot of people to participate in sport and, and football in particular. So, Dave, I just want to bring you in here. Mm. Do you think this is going to be accelerated under this Conservative government as another fiscally responsible fantasy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was, a, there was, it seemed to be a, a brief uh, fleeting moment, uh, probably around about six or seven weeks ago, uh, where Rishi Sunak obviously sort of came in with the, the sort of the, the, the furlough uh, scheme, wanted to support businesses, looked to be for as much as a conservative government could be quite a pro progressive conservative government. I, I see now that that kind of moment has passed. And I think we are going to get to a moment where austerity reemerges. And I think for the next 10 years, I mean, we've already had 10 years of austerity. I think we're, we're in line for a, a further decade, uh, at least of, of austerity, because this will all be about rebalancing the books once the crisis comes to an end. And we, we, you know, it, it's far from clear how this crisis will come to an end and, and how Britain will come out of lockdown. But this is going to be, you know, we know about the, the economic challenges that, that lie ahead. And this will have a huge impact, uh, particularly upon grassroots football. Um, and, you know, grassroots football, I'm not, of course, I'm not going to say that grassroots football has, has, has borne the brunt uh, of that austerity, but it has, you know, when we've seen kind of, you know, leisure facilities being cut, when councils are faced with ever reducing uh, funding pots from central government, they're turning around saying, well, we've got to prioritise. We've got to prioritise health and social care. We've got to prioritise schools. We've got to prioritise these kind of core areas. Where's that money going to come from? Well, it's, we're going to have to move it from our libraries. We're going to have to move it away from our uh, playing fields. We're going to have to move it away from um, the kind of non-essentials. Uh, and I think that that's the, this is at the, precisely at the moment where... Um, you know, there, there's a there's a clear existential threat to to grassroots football. What's also a, a problem as well within this kind of period of of it, because it's not simply about austerity because austerity is a, is a is a political choice. But what will compound that austerity are the economic challenges uh, that the kind of the, the broader networks. I mean, Dan and and Paul in their work, for example, they kind of look at the the broader networks within which football clubs sit so you're looking at those small businesses which feed into uh, football clubs and which obviously football clubs themselves benefit small businesses so this kind of idea of embeddedness uh, that myself and uh, Paul Widdop have talked about is important here because within those local business communities we're going to see a lack of investment coming in uh, to these football clubs so we saw we're talking about sponsorship deals uh, of, of smaller clubs um, being held back we're going to see um, people less likely uh, in a post-crisis context to turn up and support uh, their football club and that makes coming back to Sean's really important point there that makes clubs really vulnerable because as going concerns then these football clubs will simply say, well, there's no viable future. And that's when I think, as Sean says, that's when the kind of the, almost like the, the venture capitalists, the investors will come in and, and, and asset strip. So, you, you know, we've seen this current pandemic actually compound uh, the existing structural inequalities that exist within the game. And on top of that, the austerity that we will see in the future um, will deepen that inequality and deepen those structural fault lines as well. 
So Jim, do you want to add anything to that? I know a lot of your research and your books focuses on grassroots facilities and the importance of grassroots football within communities. Is that something that you'd like to... Yeah, I mean, I suppose the, 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 the issue that my book looked at was the, the football experience that um, kind of uh, that occurs at kind of the lower levels of the game, the Sunday league, youth football, and the lower levels of Saturday football. And you know, as people mentioned, uh, austerity has, has really changed that in you know, kind of two ways. One's been touched on, kind of the, the massive deterioration of uh, the quality of pitches. So where, where I coach in East Sussex, you know, week, week in, week out, games are cancelled. And when, when they do take place, the, the pitches that the, that the kids play on are terrible. Um, alongside that, You've also got uh, had a, a massive increase in what it costs to use these pitches. So, so last season, for example, you're paying a lot more to pay to play on a a, a pitch that's deteriorated in quality. And in parts of the the country, that's meant uh, well. In most parts, that's that's meant an increase in, in in subs. And there are parts of of a country like Liverpool, Newcastle, Manchester, where uh, kids are now getting priced out of football mm. for the first time. So. We meant to have this idea of a people's game and, and football for all, but the FA are uh, very much behind. But actually, it's slowly becoming a, a postcode lottery in many areas. And also, um, you're getting uh, kids who are disenfranchised from football, which is, you know, that's a, a, a kind of terrible result from austerity to have, to have kids who want to play football who, who can, can no longer do it. Is, it's a disgrace. And if, if that's what's happened in the last 10 years, if we get 10 more years of that, that's only going to get worse. Mm. Yeah, so Dave, I know you mentioned something about the purpose of grassroots football and it not being there just to find the next big star. Do you yeah. want to tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, and this really touches on what, what Jim said there. And I, I think that this, what, that point that Jim just made there about the everyday um, and what football is for, football gives us a social purpose. Now, Josh, I think you started off really well in, you, in, in terms of talking about your own experiences of of, of grassroots and I know you said yeah, I don't really want to talk about it but actually that's a really important narrative to tell and everybody's kind of got their stories about grassroots football and what it means to them the kind of paper that I'm writing with with my wife at the moment which we're sort of talking about this in terms of the social bonds now I, I suppose in a, in a kind of time of pandemic and coronavirus in particular it's those social bonds that have actually been dis, dismantled and disrupted so and in that sense, football does matter. We've always been told that football doesn't matter and, and so forth. But football really does matter because those kind of social bonds that we've been able to enjoy, those friendships and kinships and, and so forth that we've been able to base our footballing experience in around, they've been disrupted, they've gone. And the point that there that Jim's talking about is that those friendships that form out of football the kind of the leadership the teamworking all these kind of social skills even leaving aside football for one moment that kids are being deprived of that and being deprived of that in what is essentially the world's leading economy if you like footballing economy i just think that that's that is an appalling state of affairs you know, we've got a situation where we've got this game, this elite game right at the top, but right at the grassroots, we've got kids who are unable to afford to go and play and, and have a kick around with their friends. They're not unable to afford boots. They're unable to afford kit and, and so forth. I just think that is, as a moral issue, that is utterly, utterly uh, appalling. Um, and I think as well, it's not about the elite. The point I was making in our kind of uh, preamble is that it's not really about, this isn't about finding the next, uh, the next superstar. Um, it's about that kind of everyday enjoyment, those social bonds, those social ties um, that, that kind of create communities, that communities can get around. It's not all about the elite. It's not uh, everything. We've kind of got the discussion and, the wrong way around in this country it always is about the elite in this country and it's not it's not it's all about those kind of at the grassroots the community level those friendships that are formed those kind of familial ties you know you think about it in a really basic way i can't go and watch a game of football with my dad now i can't go and watch a game with my father-in-law you know we're kind of 
isolated from one another. We saw at the weekend what that was like. Yeah. You know, it's, it's entirely different. As soon as you take that so, those social interactions out of football, it becomes, what is it? it? It's nothing. We need to kind of re-embed this idea that football is this social pastime. And I think, you know, the people's game, we often kind of use it as a, um, it, it's a bit of a throwaway comment, but there's, there's a real sense of meaning in that. And I think football has to have, you know, refine its social contract. Yeah. I think it's important, an important point to pick up on that you were saying about the social bonds and going to the game with people. Um, Wes, if I can bring you in here. Initially, you wanted to discuss the impact of non-league football and lower down the pyramid. And the financial future of non-league football is quite bleak, as you've, as you've demonstrated with us and, and shown us the GoFundMe pages that have been set up. Um, and a lot of these clubs may be relying on the hand-to-mouth financial model, as we, we recognise it, and to support these, these sorts of social events and the Saturday fixtures and general clubhouse-related um, activities that go on. Um, so do you just want to tell us a little bit about that and, and what the future is for non-league? Yeah, um, yeah. I've looked at GoFundMe pages as a librarian, just did a simple search, went to GoFundMe, FC UK, looked for that, and I found some clubs like Altrium. Um, if you ask Gary James, a Man City fan, Peter Swells was their first chairman, I think. So you've got rather big non-league clubs asking for money. I'm in a local district called Beckenham, highly good middle class area. Um, they're also got a guy who goes on me pages. Um, what was the other one? Grantham. Some of you might want to remember Grantham, lovely place. I think some woman was born there, I can't remember her name. Um, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, so um, these are rich areas and they're asking for money. They're not going to the government, they're not going to the FA because they know they're not going to get it. They're already going to go funny pages, and these places can afford to, might be able to afford to pay their teams to keep going. But you know, some of these clubs like Beckenham, um, they have a chairman whose business is sport. They've got sponsors which are, it's like Dave is saying, these, these, these bonds are also financial. They've got, they've got a, uh, their sponsor is a Mazda car company which puts their cars in there. You're not going to sell cars. They're going to lose their sponsorship. They're not paying their rent. So Beckenham are struggling, and they're in a rich area. So I'm, I'm concerned, even in the rich areas, it's going to be a struggle. But in poor areas like Barrows or where I'm from, Devon or Cornwall, it's going to be more difficult to get sponsorship. Like Sean was saying, I think those sponsorships, just check GoFundMe pages. There are big clubs. Even Dundalk. Dundalk are a big club. Now these, these are really big non-league clubs, Altrincham, big, nearly league team. You know, so those are, that would be my point on financial aspects. Yeah. So, Jim, do you just want to carry on that on? I know your um, research in your book, Punk Football, looks at how we approach football in, in a different sort of perspective. Um, and do you think that that's going to become the norm as we leave um, this period of, of the COVID economy as it was into in, in the non-league and lower parts of the football pyramid? Do you think that we're going to see a different approach to football ownership and how we view football clubs? Um, you mean from, from, from fans or from the authorities? Just, just in, in general, from, from top to bottom, really. I think, I mean, a lot of the noise that you get from uh, football at the moment uh, they want to return to, to to normal. That's kind of what gets put about a lot. I guess what by that they mean they want to return to the situation that existed prior to the the, the pandemic. And as as we've been, been discussing, you know, it's not like the game was working well beforehand. Mm. So I think you, you would hope that in light of this and and a spotlight being thrown on grassroots football, you'd you'd um, you'd get a change but I, I don't see I don't think there's much appetite from the football authorities to change things there's certainly not much appetite from the Premier League to support grassroots football even more so it's you know whilst it's it's great that um, more people are looking at kind of that the handsome up existence that many um, non-league clubs face I think the idea that there's suddenly going to be a, a sea change in the way that we govern the game and, and, and the support that, that, that exists down there, I, I don't see that happening. I don't see where the appetite comes from, to be honest. 
Sean, I think I know this is something that you discussed in in preparation for this about the governance of the game, uh, especially with the five percent drip down as it was from the Premier League and the emergence of the Football Foundation. And I think that's uh, quite a good point to start um, on that discussion. If you just want to, yeah, yeah, sure. That. I mean, I think that I'm not optimistic about we're going to get an increase in government expenditure, not necessarily because of the ideology of the current government or that's something. I just think that there's going to be so much competition for resources that even if you had a very progressive government, I think that to make the case for you know, a major, major grassroots investment in sport in this environment is going to be very difficult. I think that what's going to but, but there are, I think there are ways forward. I mean, if you go back to the Football Foundation now, I mean I personally am a bit, of, I think it does good work and um, you know, I'm sure it has its shortcomings. I mean, people are in a better position to maybe talk about how it impacts in terms of you know, the physical facilities are built. But I think that what was the principle that was established by the task force, I mean, one of the, one of the few advantages about being an older geezer is that you were around when these things happened. And, you know, one of the achievements of the, of the task force back in the late 90s, which was, remember, set up by the new, the labor, new labor government as a way of, trying to look at how to deal with some of the over-commercialization at the time, was this idea that the Premier League should pay 5% of the broadcasting tax to the grassroots. And the foundation was set up, and it was now a tripartite between government, the Premier League, the FA. Now, Dave Cohn has written extensively about whether or not it still is 5%, but I think at least it's, it is, it's an institutional manifestation of a principle of solidarity that you can build on. You know, at least it established the principle that the Premier League should pay some percentage of its broadcasting deal to the English grassroots. I mean, Dave and one of us in an, in a, in an article uh, in, 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 um, in Saturday Poms talk is about the need for a broadcasting tax. And I would agree with him about that. I think that essentially builds on that original idea that was behind the setting up of the, the foundation. I mean, uh, Dave as well, and also Daniel G, the, 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 the prominent lawyer, has also talked about a transfer tax. Um, I mean, uh, we were talking before this started, it was in the context, David was, uh, was talking about the, the debate about if Wembley should have been sold to pay for the grassroots, and if I haven't, if I'm not misrepresenting, they said, well, a one, a one off hit isn't what we need. We need we need consistent income. Mm. And I think if, if you relate that back to actually what happens at UEFA and even the very malign, the much maligned FIFA, you know that UEFA have a scheme called Hattrick where the vast majority of the surplus from the Euro goes to grassroots activities in the national associations. Mm. And it makes quite an impact in, in countries, you know, smaller countries. Similarly, FIFA have a, have a project called FIFA Forward where they, they, they promote development. Um, now, it doesn't have much of an impact in a country like England, but in, in, in developing countries, it's had a big impact. And in fact, one of the things that Jenny Fontino did when he came in was he doubled the amount of money that they were spending. Now, you know, there's all kinds of cynical interpretations of that when it's a way of getting re-elected and all the rest of it. But I think the central point for me here is that there is a central principle, going back to the, 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 the fact that the Premier League has to pay into the foundation, UEFA hat trick, FIFA, FIFA forward, which is that it is right that the elite pay solidarity to the grassroots. And I think that a key argument now has to be how can we get the football, the, the money making parts of football, to make better on that commitment? Personally, I think it's, we're, it's long, long overdue that we had a serious gambling tax. I mean, all the Olympic sports in Britain are basically funded from a, from the, the national lottery, you know, which was set up by John Major in part to fund those sports. So I think that, you know, we need to be, you know, I think we're not going to get the money from public expenditure directly. We need, we need to be creative about it. And I think that one way forward is to, is essentially tax on the commercial game uh, to go back into grassroots. Um, I mean, I've got a few other ideas about mutualism, but I mean, I think that's enough for now. I think, I think there needs to be a debate 
made with all the political parties that there has to be a higher level of solidarity from the money making ends of football, the Premier League, the Champions League, the FIFA World Cup. Uh, and there needs to be a gambling, a serious, serious tax on gambling on sport to fund grassroots. Dave, have you got anything to add to yeah, that? Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely with, with what Sean was saying there. I, I think that, that principle of solidarity is, is hugely important. Um, th this is an issue that is so uh, structural that it won't be sort of resolved in a single transaction as we would have seen with the sale of Wembley. And, and I kind of argued this. Um, there's a there's a paper I'm hoping that will be coming out uh, very soon and, and uh, based a, a, upon something I wrote for when Saturday comes. Um, what's what's interesting, as just as, um, as Sean was talking there, I, was, I just remembered um, the government's of the Conservative Party's own commitment to to increase funding in grassroots. Now it's it's highly likely, as, as Sean suggests, that we will see that kicked into the long grass. Um, this was uh, it may have sort of gone underneath the radar of uh, the last general election, but. Um, I can't remember how much it was now. It was around about £730 million that the government said, right, we're going to invest into grassroots football. Typically, this was all part of a bigger sort of strategy towards uh, England hosting the 2030 uh, World Cup. Um, but nevertheless, it, it sort of s suggested a, a change. I'm not going to suggest sea change, but a change uh, in terms of how um uh, of how grassroots football could be funded so i think there is a a foothold if you like um you know in terms of the initiatives there that that sean talks about there oh. that you said well actually it doesn't necessarily have to come up directly out of the public purse there are other avenues football can create its own wealth it doesn't necessarily have to now i do think you know for all the reasons that we talked about in terms of the kind of this the kind of a socialization that, that grassroots football can that provides that actually it's in the government's best interests to actually invest in grassroots football because of the health benefits because of the social benefits and so forth and indeed because of as the fa themselves recognize because there are actual economic benefits to grassroots football but football it can be based upon the wealth that exists right at the top of the game can actually invest um, uh, in football lower lower down the league pyramid. Now, what makes what I think complicates this um, is the squeezed middle, uh, and I don't want to necessarily tread on the toes of, of other panels that are going to come, um, but we're going to see a sort of the if you like the middle class club clubs, the or the upper working class middle class clubs uh, across the league pyramid, if the, the league pyramid itself they're going to experience some financial difficulty. It might well be that they need um, some sort of support in order to kind of get them through the next few years. So grassroots, you would suspect, though, would be knocked down that pile in terms of, uh, in, in terms of, uh, uh, of, of a sort of spending priorities. That is obviously problematic um, because... It's just another hurdle for, for grassroots football. It's nobody seems to want to take responsibility for it. Um, certainly, the Premier League don't want to take responsibility for it. The football league says, "Look, we've got our own problems," and the FA says, "Look, we're trying to manage everything else." I think we, alongside these initiatives that Sean suggests we perhaps need to look at the way in which the game is actually structured and the game is actually governed. It, and I think it brings us back to the fundamental question is whether the FA itself is fit for the purpose of administrating football in this country. I'm not sure. It is quite a common gripe among football fans, how we filter the money at the top down to the bottom of the game. But it does seem that now is a good opportunity to, to mobilise and move towards putting pressure upon the government to do so. Um, Jim, just want to bring you in here. How do you think we, we, we mobilise towards implementing this? That's really difficult, isn't it? Because, I mean, you are asking for a completely different way of, uh, 
of how football is is organised and, and, and funded. And I suppose you, I suppose on on the one hand, you've got fans and those who are involved in grassroots football who who understand the problems that football at that level faces. Um, but set against that, you've got the football authorities, those who've got the the power to to enact change and the, and the power to change funding, who. I think largely seem disinterested and it'd be hard to see how any movement could shift that. I mean, something you just, you just mentioned there about the FA being fit for purpose, that's part of the problem, is that the FA are uh, meant to be the guardians of the grassroots game and yet they constantly drag their heels on, uh, on, on reform and change. Um, their funding priorities are often skewed. I mean, whilst they've done great things in some areas like women's football, and disability football, they've also made countless mistakes. They've, um, you know, they've got no control over, um, as Sean mentioned, over the small side of the game. And even when they do invest uh, and do the things that you want them, them to do. So a, a, a good example is a park life program, which is a, a network of um, artificial hubs around the country. The idea being to get more kind of plastic pitches and therefore more reliability. So they've done this in conjunction with the Premier League, and it's a big investment program. But what is created locally is a, a, a two-tier system. So you've got these pitches up, uh, have opened, and they cost something like 180 pounds a hire for an hour. So obviously, middle-class clubs get access to this fantastic 4G, 3G surface, and then those from poorer backgrounds are cut out from that and left to play on it, increasingly poor counter pitches. So it's not just a case of, uh, you know getting change involved, it's the right sort of change. And the FA, from, certainly from experience of writing my book and talking to people across the game, the FA is not, uh, it's not respected, it's not trusted either. So if you want a uh, reform in the game and I change how it's funded and, and organised, maybe looking at the FA is, is the first job. Yeah. Anyone want to carry that on? I, I would echo that. I think the FA, uh, have singularly shown themselves as being in need of reform itself. You know, they've, they've been weak in standing up to the Premier League. Um, and I think if once we start to look at where those inequalities exist, you know, as Jim was saying, th these are inequalities that exist right across, uh, right across the country. And so you're, not, you're talking about inequalities between the biggest clubs, the wealthiest clubs, and the grassroots game as well. But you're also talking about inequalities that exist in those communities where you would expect uh, participation of football to be at its highest. You look at the you've got a paper on this a couple of uh, a year or so ago on this. You look at those communities where these largest clubs are. You kind of got this. David Goldblatt talks about this in borrows uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's idea um, of, um, uh, of 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 kind of public public squalor and private prosperity and that's precisely what we've got in football is you've got these kind of gleaming glistening stadiums Anfield and you've got the likes of the Etihad and you've got the Emirates and so forth but if you go into those communities there's no way that the, 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 the vast majority of those residents in and around those stadiums can afford you know like Jim was saying the 180 uh, you know, pound an hour uh, pitches, which the FA is investing in, it has no kind of sense of its own communities. I think that's fundamental to this. So would you argue, Les, that the FA should be funding these non-league clubs that are probably cheaper to hire for people, that the clubhouses aren't as um, extensive with, with plastic pitches, etc.? Do you think that, that should be something the FA should move towards? I, I do, but I don't think it's going to. The Conservative government have, have said that they're not going to raise taxation. That's, that's a given. There'll be, like they said, there's going to be 10 more years of austerity. Um, I can't see a Labour government winning, unfortunately. <laughs> but, you know, might do. Um, but I also find something else, which I, I'm going to put a link in from Jeanette Winterson. So it's from Twitter, and, she's, uh, and it's this whole principle that our culture cannot be based around, uh, there's just a binary. She goes, and I'm quoting, so excuse the language, 
fucking so-called culture sector yakking about football as a priority? How about bookshops? How do bookshops and libraries become non-essential? I can see that theatres are tricky, but galleries can work. Crime spots have always worked. Life of the imagination, anyone? It's almost like we can't have both. No. After COVID-19, we're going to need something to go back to. It's, the new normal doesn't mean we've got to have more pain. Um, so I think we've got to start reaching out and investing in these areas. But how, I don't know, because I can't see the Tories being willing to put up taxation to the rich. But they would be willing. Well, Hancock on Friday was saying that he's not going to have a pay rise to the nurses. I mean, Dan and Dave, your family are working in that area. And it's like, they put their lives on the line. Um, whereas Richard Branson's put his island on sale. So that's my place. That's what I say. So research would suggest that the glaring financial inequality of participation is going to grow um, after this. Um, Dave, how bad do you think that's going to become and do you think we are going to see an even, an even wider gap between the social, social classes sorry, and how they access football? Um, yeah, I, I, I can't see. I think we're going to see more, more of the selling off uh, of pitches. Um, you, you know, local councils are going to be so. We need we need some money from somewhere. Um, if the government isn't going to raise taxes, um, if it's not going to give us more money to invest in our in our local areas, then we will need to find the money ourselves. So I mean, this is against the broader context of the government will always turn around and say, look, we're not telling these local councils to cut back on um, uh, leisure facilities to shut down the libraries and all the rest of it. But those are the decisions that have to be taken uh, because of these, because of the funding cuts that are taken by the treasury. So I, I think it's, we're in a really, really dangerous time. For, for for community sport more generally, but you know, when you talk about Jeanette Winston, you, the, the, there are no binaries. You know, I, I love going to the library, but I also love going down to the. You know, we need an investment in any in in other things other than the economic. You know, anything other than um, anything that has a market value. We kind of this is that that's the core problem, I think is that everything has to be measured. It has to have an, uh, a market value. Well, having an 11 aside game doesn't have a market value. You know, a library doesn't have a market value. It's these kind of cultural iterations and, and social interactions that are really, really important to everyday life. But so I think what, but what we're going to see here is, is we're going to see more and more grassroots clubs go to the wall. We're going to see more and more. I would be surprised if within the next four or five years, a number of even league clubs are going to struggle and a number are going to go out of existence. Um, that will obviously attract a great deal of the kind of the, the news coverage and, and so forth. Uh, but for those involved at grassroots, we'll see well, you know, we've not got players who are coming, they can't afford the subs. You know, we've, they've not got the disposable income to be able to uh, to turn up and play week in, week out. Jim was saying earlier about the quality of the pitches. There's not going to be any investment in those pitches, in suitable pitches uh, right across the, the, the uh, groups. So it's like, well, if we've not got any pitches, if we've not got anywhere to play, then we simply can't. We, we can't be. so th the whole thing just falls apart and I think that that sounds very pessimistic and I really really want to be wrong but I can't see on the current trajectory of this government and its ideology how, how there's a how we kind of um, go beyond that I think that's a great point um, to end on and I'll now Open the floor if anyone has any questions. Just um, pop your video on, unmute yourself and ask away. I think we've got another 10 or 15 minutes. So hopefully if, if everyone's got a question, they'll, they'll be able to have it answered. Josh, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Go on. 
no questions or provocation. And I apologize to Danny and Dan Parnell for having listened to this for a long time before. What strikes me is what Dave's just said and Liz just said, and to an extent Sean, it's about homelessness and the fact that many of our teams, many of the teams I've played for or have managed are peripatetic and we're reliant on other people. And that we said that maybe the ownership model, or that, sorry, certainly the administration model of the FA is imperfect. And it strikes me we have a more successful, if nonetheless imperfect example of an organisation which can provide us with an, example, uh, an answer to this, and that's a GAA, where in my home county, where there are 42 right, yeah. small, uh, mostly, mostly small parish-based clubs, every one of those clubs has a ground, at least one ground, if not two or three grounds, for every team from the age of under eight, both girls and boys, right up to senior level, including under 21s. And where I, in my home club, which my brother was the Arrow Rogue and Craig Avon, which is a new town uh, just outside between Lurgan and Portadown. You know, we have two teams playing right through under 21, and we've got two senior teams, senior and junior B. Now, the GAA has its problems at the elite level where Sky Sports money and, and, the, and the investment in elite teams of both hurling and football is skewing the comp competition at senior level. But if I want to make sure that I've got a, a child or as I have two nephews playing in North Down, they can play all the Gaelic football they want until the age of 18 and 19 and nobody can put them off that. Yeah. And the roots of that is because the GA is a nationalist organisation. It's a constitutionally nationalist organisation and it's also a culturally nationalist organisation. And it's based because people like Michael David said, well, the Brits aren't going to get our land again. So we will vest the deeds of all of these clubs in Croke Park. And there are lots of things wrong with our organisation. But I know that any of my younger relatives or friends who have kids playing football, mostly football, I know, you know a few people who play hurling, that they can do so until 18 or 19 very, very affordably. And not only that, they're socialising with their friends from school, with people from their same area. They're learning the Irish language. They're able to speak uh, to Irish sports. There are a clubhouse where are a social club where people can go and have a drink. And there's a very successful community model based on community ownership and community control. There are problems, and I'm sure Sean Hamill will jump in, Sean no, uh, and a few other people will know the problems that there are vested in the, in the elite part that Croke Park has as the kind of HQ of the, of, of the organization. But in terms of providing particularly a youth sport model, that ownership model guarantees that your kid can go and play a game of football at least once a week if they, at least once a week if they want. And for very little outlay, you get a bag and a, a tracksuit and a top which is more than ever happened for a lot of the clubs that I have managed in the Merseyside over the last 19 years. That's more of a provocation than a question. I apologise. No problem. Uh, Dan, I think you've got a question if you just want to. Cheers, Josh. Thanks very much, fellas. Um, I think we touched on it at the start, but uh, my, my question would be, what needs to be done? And then the second question to that is, what can we do in terms of the collective to try and help towards this otherwise you know what what's the point that was an easy one so take your time don't all speak it don't all speak at once well i mean i i, I could maybe respond to both Paddy and dan's point i mean i agree with you 100 percent, Paddy. i mean i played a lot of gm we used for russell gilly and then patrick at the time we were on a council pitch now they have a fantastic facility and you know, one of the things I, I was very, some of you will know, I was very heavily involved with Supporters Direct, which was about promoting cooperative ownership of clubs. Now, we had some successes, but it, had, it, it hasn't been successful as we hoped it would. But the late Brian Loma actually set it up. Brian had been influenced by the GA. Because what Brian used to say, even though he was a Liberal Democrat, was that in, in a capitalist society, ownership is, property rights is key. Yeah. And if you look at all the clubs in the Premier League, I mean, the two Liverpool clubs, classic example, I mean, they started out as church social clubs. They were all members associations for benefit. And then what happened was they needed capital investment and local business people who could see the, the entertainment entrepreneur, entrepreneurs that they saw the opportunity and they, they bought it for, bought those clubs for a song. And, you know, in the absence of public expenditure in this area, and even if we get what we want in terms of higher solid. I mean, I'm not actually against the Premier League of itself. I think it's a great competition. I mean, I'm a season ticket holder at Celtic. It's a public limited company in the stock market, you know, so 
But what I so I, I want I still want to create competition, but I think they've got to pay their dues yeah. to the grassroots. You know, like everybody else, they've got to pay their taxes for for the system. But to come back to, to, to Paddy's point and, and, and what can be done, I think that one of the tragedies of the eighties was, you know, the the building society movement being privatized. Every single building society that was privatized doesn't exist anymore because the banks they were absorbed into went bankrupt. You know, we, we need to go back to self-help. Even the original, how did football get started? People wanted to play a game after work. People wanted to watch a game after work. You know, I think we need to go back to those principles. And I mean, this is not necessarily an argument for a rejuvenated uh, supporters direct, but maybe, maybe it is. But there was a very interesting case at AFC Wimbledon before Christmas. Some people at the Dons Trust that owned the club there, the, the original Phoenix Club, wanted to bring in private investors because they thought that the club had gone as far as it could. A lot of people didn't want that because they said it's a fans club. That club has been built from the ground up again by the fans. They raised 5.2 million in four months. And I, I just feel that the way out of this is going to be, you know, this mutual idea of mutual, progressive mutual self-help. You know, not some kind of mutual self-help that is sort of some kind of libertarian madness, mm. you know, where we all get tooled up with an, a, with an AK-47 or some and buy a bunker in Arizona. You know, like the kind of thing that Paddy and me grew up with. And I, I think if we, you know, to me, but it, it needs to be better if I can be self-critical about Supporters Direct. You know, what do they say? They say pioneers get shot, scepters make money. I think there needs to be more thought into the model. I had a long conversation with Jim during the week about this. And I knew things were tough at the grassroots, but I didn't realize how tough. There has to be some way, right, to not just provide the money, but to rejuvenate the, the sort of the, the institutional frameworks of the grassroots. I mean, the, the criticism of the FA, I think, the, at the top of the FA, there's a problem. You've got the leagues on the one hand representing commercial interests and the national game. You know, it, 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 there's, there's, there's an institutionalized conflict there. I think to some extent they've resolved a lot of the problems. I think the real issue is at the level of the county FA. I mean, that is a gap in my knowledge. I mean, they are institutionally responsible for the grassroots. They elect people to the FA council, which is a sovereign policy-making body. What do they do? Mm. Are they modern? You know, I mean, it seems to me you get to be a member of the FA Council as a, as a, as a long service award. So, I mean, I've done a lot of talking there, but I mean, I, I just, to, to, to get back to the core, I think we need to rejuvenate this mutual self-help idea, independent sports clubs, you know, organizers, industrial and provident society, um, who are explicitly community-based organizations, and they're independent of the state. Anybody want to uh, address how we can sort of use the collective as a, as a way to mobilise? And... Sorry, Josh, before we jump in, that could we also say that we have examples of associated type of institutions or institutions associated with football in the Merseyside area, which are investigating forms of community ownership, which I think dovetail with some of the kind of appreciable mm. qualities of the GA in terms of a, of a community owned organisation. Look at Homebeck at the back of the uh, at the back of the cop on Breck Road in Unfield. It starts off as community bakery. Now it's uh, using the community land trust to investigate and ban land around that area because the club has been, you know, instrumental in letting a lot of the land and a lot of the housing stock run down for its own investment interests. You know, one of the things I'd love somebody if the, if somebody I'm very much an amateur both at football studies coming from political science and media studies, and particularly Irish republicanism and Irish, the sort of Irish political uh, um, political science. I'd love maybe somebody would like to co-own co-author something be about this. Is there a way that we can think about community land trust? Is there a way we can look at sort of that, that community kind of model, which is borrowed from things like GAA, and we can investigate, you know, even just position papers in which we investigate some of these institutions associated with football, like things like Homebeck or, you know, some of the kind of ultras organizations, say, surround the Celtic and, and, and people like that, where we see this, 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 this turn from the private back to the public, private back to the community. This idea that people who take ownership not have an ownership forced on them because they have to, which was the public-private ownership model of, mm. of, of both the, Tory, of the Tories first and then 
um, the new labour. I'd love to see if we can, if, if a few of us could sit down and say, right, can we look at what's good about the GAA and associate organisations? You know, even in Liverpool, I'll be honest with you, like, you know, uh, in Liverpool, we've got teams playing from eight until under 21, all in inverted commas mainland born to Irish parents, and we own two of our own pitches in Liverpool. Well, how can a GAA club of immigrants do that in Liverpool? And most football clubs can't. It's just beyond me. Mm. Sorry. I think there's, there's a there's a particular point there about, um, I think, as Paul Widdop's talked about this before, in terms of the kind of the cultural capital that's associated with establishing um, these sorts of clubs and, and re-embedding. It requires a great deal of graft and hard work to kind of and 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 kind of know how to kind of get because everything is stacked against you you know and I think that that's particularly problematic you know clearly the FA in the way that it's set up and I think the point there I think Dan it, it makes it makes it in the, in the chat um, box is that the FA isn't geared towards helping smaller clubs and county FAs aren't geared towards uh, towards help. There are always other interests. There are you know conflicts of interest there. Um, in terms of the point that you make there, in terms of um, sort of local communities, uh, Alan Southern's work um, just immediately sprung to mind um, in terms of those kind of community businesses, certainly obviously within the Liverpool Merseyside area. Um, I think p part of the problem. And I say this as a Liverpool fan, um, and, and Jim will no doubt agree with me. It is it is part of the whole of the, the overall discourse surrounding elite level football, um, and it, this ke keeps emerging. It's like, well, it's not our problem, and you, you know that. I think that is pretty much the attitude of of a lot. I, I'm going to say a lot of Premier League clubs, particularly. It's just, all that matters to us is Champions League football, and it's the kind of that elite. There isn't that sense uh, of the social meaning that is afforded to. Um, I think me and Dan Parnell have had this conversation as well. There isn't this. It's it's more about. We might even go as far as say, yeah, yeah, we're we're, we're kind of socialists, of course we are, but we sort of wear it as a sort of badge of honour, without having a fuller sense of what that actually what that actually means in terms of issues such as mutualism in terms of the, the benefit of the game to, to clubs we you know I mean we saw this earlier in the year when Liverpool played Shrewsbury and there's a whole kind of dis discourse around well it's not our problem if Shrewsbury, if Shrewsbury are a small club if Shrewsbury are a small club that's the way things are um, I think there's a there's a broader debate to kind of change this supremacy. I, I agree with Sean. I, I'm a Liverpool fan and, you know, we're, we're a Premier League club. But I think it's got to go beyond that. And this emphasis always upon the elite, and I've talked about this before, this emphasis always upon the elite, it kind of obfuscates any sort of discussions around social value of embeddedness of mutualism all of which are actually key to what we're trying to achieve here in terms of a much more sustainable form of football i mean i know uh, you've just said you've got a question if we just take that as the last question and then uh, we'll end on that danny what does that mean josh sorry yeah 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 hi everyone it wasn't so much um a question, just following on from, from your uh, your point, Josh, about what can we do as a collective and what, what Paddy was saying. Um, I'd responded to, to Dan's email uh, a week or so back about the, the Culture, Media and Sports Collect Committee and whether the collective would like to submit um, some evidence, a kind of memorandum to that committee. So that's something I would be keen to do and lots of things that have, have, that have been spoken about um, in this session about the current you know, governance structure for football, what's the FA's role, what will be the, the economic fallout uh, of the, the kind of COVID-19 and what, what would we recommend, you know, as a, as a collective of, of people and scholars interested in football, you know, in, the, in a very short term, kind of in the next three months and then kind of like the next six to 12 months. 
So I'd be interested in, in, in kind of in submitting something. So if anyone is also keen to contribute, and we could look at something. That, when you were saying, Paddy, about I know you spoke it before about the, the GAA and kind of how that offers an alternative model, which seems to work or seems to have things that can can offer you know very concrete examples of how to do things differently. So yeah, it's just a I suppose a call for anyone who's interested. Drop yeah. me an email or I've, Danny. I've, hello, mate. Um, I've just popped up the um, the web link if anybody wants to kind of have a look at that um, after you've finished, and then I suppose get back to you, Danny, with because it, it's just it's just an outline of what the um, select committee are uh, actually looking for. Yeah, I think no, that's, that's important to look at after these sessions, especially making sure that we carry on the momentum of each session going into the next one and then building up that evidence base to work towards. Um, so that's great. I think we'll, we'll probably put out a tweet on the collective um, account with, with you, Danny, and then we'll go from there. Um, Dan, I'll pass over to you. Um, thank you for everyone joining. Um, I think next week, Dave, it's you on Thursdays, isn't it? No, um, that Dan's, uh, Dan's uh, super subbing. Okay. No problem. Yeah, on, on Thursday, I'm stepping into Dave's role as chair. That means I have to say less and have <laughs> less insight. Um, and then before that, we've got Maggie Murphy, who's joined us from the Women's FC. So quite excited about that with Alex Corbin. So all the details are there. And just a m massive thanks to Josh and Les and, and everyone who's contributed, Dave, Sean, Paddy, Jim, um, for getting involved. Thanks so much. And yeah, we're looking forward to Join us on Thursday. Cheers, fellas. Thanks, everyone. Take Bye. care. Cheers. Bye.